size of a cabbage, just like I suspected. Oh my gosh. So over here next to the boy goats, look at here. Hello and welcome back to Sage and Stone Homestead. My name is Heather. We are going to do our second garden tour of the 2023 season. I was gonna space these further out in May, but the garden is exploding very, very quickly, very rapidly. So weekly garden tours are definitely in order. As an example, I don't know if you guys remember what these sunflowers looked like last week, but they are much, much bigger this week. And another very surprising to me development this week is how crazy these peas have gone. This is my first time growing a shelling pea, and just last week we had only flowers on here, and now there are all kinds of pea pods. There are just a bunch here. Now I have noticed that I think this is probably birds are coming by and kind of chewing off the top, but it doesn't seem to really be slowing them down much, at least down here. Peas are really great about putting off side shoots, and so even though the tops are pretty much eaten off of all of these, they're still bushing out really nicely and they're still setting blooms. There's actually a couple things that I forgot to even mention and talk about last week, and we're gonna touch on them this week. And one of those things is our surprise chamomile patch right in the middle of this garden bed here. So this is the garden bed that has our blackberries on one side. And last year I grew chamomile along with the blackberry on this side. And we have some chamomile volunteers coming up in the walkway. I really need to come through here and harvest these blooms. The more you harvest, the more that they end up blooming. And a lot of these are at really the perfect harvestable stage. These ones are still quite young in here, but these ones that are just barely starting to bend their petals backwards, this is the perfect stage. I don't see any flowers in there that are overripe. You can absolutely harvest them when they're overdone, but those will have the petals really arched backwards, basically vertical. So I did move over my loofah gourds into this bed. They look pretty sad. I'm hoping that they bounce back. This one looks a little bit better, so I've got a little bit more hope for that one. But a lot of the seeds that I had started in seed trays in the greenhouse randomly got a lot of aphids basically overnight. And I did treat them, but it seems like they kind of suffered maybe for a day or two longer than they needed to. And I'm not sure that they're gonna make it, but thankfully we have a long growing season. And so I can always replant those. The corn is springing up as it does. Corn grows incredibly fast. And if you were here with us in one of my most recent videos where I made some cheese, you'll remember that I showed you guys that my potatoes are actually flowering this year. And I've actually grown potatoes every year that I have had a garden. This is my fifth garden year, and I have never seen the potatoes flower. And a lot of people who want to harvest new potatoes or there's those smaller, more tender potatoes, um, you'll harvest those about three weeks after the plants flower. But if you want the larger, like baking type potatoes, this isn't really a baking variety, but the larger potatoes with a thicker skin that have a longer storage life, you'll wait for the entire plant to die back. And I think that's what I'm gonna do this year. I still can't decide if I'm going to keep these volunteer potatoes and just eat them, or if I wanna save them in order to plant more potatoes next year. We'll just have to see. So yeah, these potatoes were not intentionally planted. There's a lot of little buds here and these blooms are going by the wayside, but they're still a little bit open. I actually have no idea if those set any kind of seed pod. I have no clue. I've never seen this before. So we'll be learning together. We are starting to see the tiniest bit of caterpillar damage on our, there he is. Took a little while for the caterpillars to find my brassicas, but they are here. You'll see those little holes inside the plants and sometimes you'll see the little caterpillar poops. We'll look for those. That's obvious caterpillar damage there, but we did get a little bit of rain earlier, so it may have washed some of their little poops away. Now these cabbages, these look relatively unscathed. But essentially caterpillar poops look like little when they're fresh, it looks like mulched up pieces of the plant, like really fine little mulched up pieces of green. And eventually it turns to these little brown, like dry crumbly looking pellet things. If I see them, I'll show you. I did notice a strange thing though with a couple of these cabbages, it looks like some of them are putting on two heads. So there's a head here, it looks like, and a head here. This one here is doing the same thing. It looks like it's putting on a head down here 
and a head over here. Some of these cabbages are very close to being harvestable size. Like this is a nice sizable cabbage. I'm gonna leave it a little bit longer, but I should probably pick that before the caterpillars really come. So over here is the garlic. And last time we were in the garden, I showed you the garlic scapes. So those are the little flower stalks that come up in the middle of the garlic plant. I have gone through here and picked off as many garlic scapes as I could. In doing so, I'm telling the plant to put more energy down into the bulb, which is what I really want to harvest. And I ended up fermenting these. I have not tasted them yet. They're not done, but I'll let you know how they are. But as you can see, you could probably tell these are starting to die back. So I think we're getting very close to harvest time. I kind of want to pull one of these up and see what's under just for science. I know I didn't plant these this far down, but somehow they've migrated pretty far and you got to be careful. I don't want to pull the center out of this garlic. So I'm just trying to get my hand underneath the bulb and I'm going to loosen it and lift it out. Yeah, there we go. Okie dokie. So this is looking really good. I like to leave as much soil in the bed as I can. So I'm just going to tap some of this off. Just like I suspected, it's very nearly harvest time for these. I'm gonna leave it a couple more days. As I mentioned, we did get a little bit of rain this morning and these are kind of wet. It's better to harvest them when they're a little bit drier. Now I will leave this to cure and I'm not gonna wash it in order to do so. I want the outside skin to get nice and dry, these little rooty things to get nice and dry and then I'm gonna hang them up for storage. I will probably harvest these and the crazy amount of oregano in another video really soon. I've gotten a lot of questions about when is a good time to plant garlic. And I know that there are specific times to plant garlic. I've always just planted garlic in the ground whenever I've wanted and harvested the garlic about six to nine months later. So that may not work in every region. It's just what I have done. I have put garlic cloves in the ground in June and July and gotten a harvest that early winter. The onions over here have their flowers going up. And if I wanted to, I could cut off all of these center flowers and encourage these to put more energy into the onion bulb. I really want to collect the seed. I have grown onion from seed a couple years ago and I actually preferred doing that. This year I had purchased some of these onion sets from the store. And really when you buy an onion set, what you're buying is a first year onion and onions do bloom on their second year. I believe they're technically biennial plants. And so when you buy those little sets from the store, you're pretty much guaranteed to get an onion that blooms, which isn't always the biggest onion. So I plan to collect lots of seed from these red onions and I'm gonna plant them from seed next year. So I've got elephant garlic over here too, and it has also set up some really awesome scapes. I have left two of these up here to flower. I really wanna see what these flowers look like. But last year when I harvested my elephant garlic, I actually did it a little bit too late. I had waited for the tops to start to die back. And by that point, the garlic bulb, the elephant garlic bulb had started to kind of separate and turn a little bit green. So I kind of wanna dig one of these up too, just to see what it's doing. Holy moly, this is in here. Oh. <laughs> so I can tell by looking at this that it is quite sizable as well. Usually you only get about four to six, maybe eight cloves on an elephant garlic, but four to six is a lot more common. There are five or so cloves on this elephant garlic and a few little corms, but I can tell that these need probably another week or two before they're fully ready. So maybe this thing will grow some more if I stick it back in the ground. I guess we'll find out. This is what my hands are going to look like the rest of the tour. Don't be mad. <laughs> Over here we've got our peppers that I bought from our local Amish nursery. And I didn't show this on camera, but what I did when I put these peppers in the ground, they were about yay high, is I actually pinched off the top of the pepper plants. And I will do this with a few different plants. I'll do it with peppers, I do it with marigolds, I do it with zinnias. And what that achieves in pinching off the top of the plant is it encourages the plant to get not so tall and lanky. It encourages it to put out side shoots and get much more bushy. It creates a much stronger plant and potentially can give you more fruit. So you can see with this pepper plant here, right there, that is where I cut off the top of the plant. And essentially we got one, two, three, looks like four little bonus side shoots out of that. 
so in theory, as long as we take good care of the plant and provide it the nutrition and the water that it needs, we could get four times as many peppers out of that plant. And we'll definitely have a more sturdy plant that can hold up to the high winds that we do get here sometimes. These are some of the peppers that I started from seed. Um, I know some of these are sugar rush peach. I put some hot peppers on this side and sweet peppers on this side. I don't remember what's what. A lot of them don't look really good, but it looks like some of them are bouncing back. This guy isn't quite tall enough, I don't think, to pinch off the top, but essentially what I'll do, I'll do it to this one just to show you guys. It's just like that. So this plant, instead of having this one stem here, it's gonna branch out just like that other one and make a lot of fruit. I'm gonna wait for some of these other pepper plants to get just a little bit bigger before I go ahead and top those as well. On this side of the pea trellis, I had put in the one birdhouse gourd that I got to germinate. These got a little bit of damage from aphids as well, uh, but it looks like this plant might actually live, so that's exciting. And I noticed a fun thing. Our first tomato flowers are here. See, many of these plants are doing so much better. They're so much bigger than they were last week. It's so amazing to see. I could probably remove these collars out from around them now. And these little guys have also started to flower, which is super exciting. I did notice too that we had a couple of volunteer beans. That is what I grew on these trellises last year, was several different varieties of beans. So we've got a couple here. I'm just gonna let them do their thing. And in the fall time, I had some squash over here. So we've got some kind of volunteer squash. Now this, being a heavy feeder, is growing too close to this tomato. So I will probably move this. So one of the sections that I neglected to show you guys last week was this little back section over here. I don't know how I forgot about it. We've got our sweet potatoes down here and this is one of our huge elderberry trees. And it's actually not that big. These can get very, very tall, very, very wide. But for us, this is the biggest elderberry plant that we have here. We have nine of them, but goodness, this one is gonna be so gorgeous when it flowers. Just look at it all. Oh my gosh, the bees are gonna love that. This plant was about a foot tall in 2020 when I put it in. Now it's 2023 and it's taller than me and it's gotten, I don't know, exponentially bigger. It's very wide. As elderberry does, it's put out these little side shoots. I don't know if it's technically a runner under the ground or what, but the original plant is right there. There is some weed fabric under here that's since gotten buried, but it's put up some plants along the roots. And down in here, this is where I'm growing my sweet potatoes this year. So this bed is three feet wide and I think four feet long. So there's 12 square feet. And I put one sweet potato plant every square foot in here. So it looks like just about every plant has taken the transplant well and is greening up nicely. Except for this, this looks like a tree probably, which we don't need. In years past, I have grown our sweet potatoes up on that arch trellis that you saw at the beginning of our garden. And I have also grown sweet potatoes in beds like this. And my yields, my harvests have been much better when I've grown them in beds like this because it kind of forces me to trim the greens back. And what that does is it basically tells the plant that we don't need to put any more energy into greens. It doesn't waste energy in maintaining all of those greens. It can focus more energy on the roots, which is what we harvest and is what we eat. So you can eat sweet potato greens. There's nothing wrong with that. So when you do trim back your sweet potato greens, put them in stir fry. They're really delicious. So I'll let the greens ramble and things inside the bed, but I really won't let them get too far outside of the bed. And that's going to ensure that we get nice, beautiful tubers. So we're still pulling in bountiful harvests of asparagus. Last season was the first season I really started harvesting from our asparagus crowns. You really should leave them for a season or two to establish. When we initially put in our asparagus beds here, we had put in two year crowns. And so the first year they were really just developing their root system, they were getting settled. And so the second year that I had them in, they were technically third year crowns. And so these are four year crowns and they're producing a whole ton. Last year I stopped harvesting right when June hit and I got a lot more big fat spears throughout the season and I think I might actually harvest a little bit longer this year. My main thing though, my main rule is to not harvest any asparagus that is the width of a pencil or thinner. But these guys are good and what I'm gonna do is actually just put them in a jar of water on the counter and we're gonna have them this week. I told you guys last week that the blackberry blossoms would be much more plentiful this week. I didn't lie. Oh look, 
There's more chamomile out here. I love it. There's actually more chamomile growing out in the sun today. Look, chamomile is such a survivor. I love it. But look at this, you guys. So many blooms. The blooms that we looked at last week have been successfully pollinated. Look at that. Just needs a few more weeks for ripening. Hi, girls. Oh, Stormy. Ma'am, how did you get out? <laughs> Go on. Is that how you got out? Gotcha. <laughs> so this is the first escapee that I have noticed this season. Leave it to a Nigerian dwarf. The fencing that we have around this particular part of the pasture is what's called field fencing. And it starts out with smaller squares on the bottom, but it gradually gets to bigger squares on the top. This is what we could afford when we first put in the fence. And it's fine for standard size goats and standard size goat kids, but Nigerians, they go through it just like water. This is the size fencing that we prefer for goats. This is a four inch by four inch. And a really small Nigerian could definitely get through that, but really not one that's you know as active as stormy is hey sir during the first couple weeks of life goats are usually pretty close to mom they don't dare venture too far so by the time they're brave enough to venture far away from mom they're usually too big to get through that four by four wire hello sirs don't touch that fence be smart oh that was close that was close so over here next to the boy goats, we have the lane. And I did just plant the lane. So some of the plants that I put in here, I don't know if they're gonna live, guys. I don't know. So I had these guys growing in my greenhouse. They look very anemic and very sad. These are the plants that I had growing in some seed pots. I talked about them in the beginning of the video a little bit. That did get a little bit of aphid damage. They are really anemic looking. Goodness, baby. We hear you, oh my goodness. So there was definitely nutrition deficiencies in the seedling pots that they were in. So I don't know how well these plants are gonna recover. There's actually a lot of them. But again, this is a really long season. We get a really long season here. And so I can always replant if these guys don't bounce back well enough. Some of them do look pretty good though. I don't know, we're just gonna have to see. I haven't had to irrigate out here quite yet because we've had so much rain. It's really been a blessing, but my plan is to actually run some drip tape along this lane here. I have a hose spigot over there for the boys and it's gonna work out quite well. I really need to do that this week probably. <laughs> so we have holes burned in the fabric every three feet. So lots of plants. So from here on is full of plants that I started already. And then from here on, I actually put lots more seeds in. So it'll be kind of interesting to see how well the plants do that I started from seed versus the ones that I started in the seed pots that got kind of a rough start. I bet you the ones that I started from seed straight in the ground are going to surpass those other ones over there that are probably about three weeks older. I mean, these guys aren't even up yet. I just put them in yesterday. But I will still inspect them a couple of times a day waiting for germination. As you can tell, I didn't put any seed markers or plant markers in the ground, so I don't really remember I remember what I put in, but I don't remember where and I don't remember how many. I stuck in some tromboncino squash, different types of melon like honeydews, some more kajaris. So it's gonna be a fun little mystery when, when these things get to fruiting. So we've done a little bit of work in the greenhouse since you and I were in here last. Levi and I put up the shade cloth, which was very needed. Now we only have a 30% shade cloth here. I really wish that I had purchased something like a 50% shade cloth and I very well may get something like that. Even now in May, and we're not in the hardest part of the year at all, it will get to be in mid nineties in here with a shade cloth on, with the fan running, with all of the ventilation options open. So I think I, think I need a little bit more intense shade cloth. But I did manage to get my cow peas planted. Over here are the black eyed peas. And these are a little anemic looking as well, but I expect these guys to bounce back really well. I don't expect that these leaves 
that were on the plant when I put them in the ground. I don't think that these are gonna green up super well, but I think the new leaves that they put on are gonna look much greener than these. And that will be really nice. So I have many, many different beans planted in here. I decided that I was going to take a risk and put some beans in the ground to see if they germinated. So a few of these holes that look empty actually do have some beans growing in them. And I saw I did have some germination. See here? Lots of germination in this hole. And I put lots of seeds in for a reason. I wanted to ensure that if we were gonna have any visitors from rodents or roly polies, that we were gonna have the best chance at getting one plant in here. So this one looks good. So I am gonna thin these plants out. Once they get a little bit bigger, I just want them to be stronger so they can withstand whatever likes to come through here and take them out. What I planted in these holes is blue lake bush beans. I really like the Blue Lake variety. They are stringless, and I find that these plants are very, very prolific. Over here we have lima beans, and I think this is the first few little flowers that I've noticed on these. And over here on the end, we've got some squash plants. Some of them I started from seed a while back and they're much bigger, but others I transplanted in. And the ones that I started from seed, looky there. We're starting to get some fruit coming on. So this is actually very exciting to see. Normally when squash plants put on their first sets of blooms, what they'll put on first are male flowers. And you can tell the difference between a male flower and a female flower when you look at the base of the flower. So a male flower on a squash plant is just a stem with a flower on the end. It's pretty basic. The female flowers though have a little tiny baby version of what the end fruit will look like at the base of the flower. And we can see both of those on this plant here. And this makes me believe that this is probably the delicata squash that I hoped germinated. <laughs> So because we're starting to see flowers come on in there, we should get harvestable fruit in about two to three weeks. Super excited to report that these guys have really started to take off ever since I stuck them in the ground over here. So they're loving life. I did really bad with marking what I planted where this year. And so I know that these are bush style varieties of squash. I just don't remember what kind. So another surprise over here. Over here though, these should be like a patty pan type squash. I did notice that, ah, so this plant. Got a couple flowers coming on. Yeah, it looks like it's probably male flowers only at this point, which is completely fine. I mean, it just makes sense that the male flowers would come before the female flowers, because if the male flower is there and waiting essentially for the female flower, then there's a better chance of success. If the female flower is there, but then the male flower is kind of lagging, there's a chance that really that female flower, which will produce the fruit that we eat, could peter out before the male flower even opens. So it's a good thing that the males are there first. It's a good design. You know, it's actually been, it's been a little while since I watered this. Let's do that. What I'm growing in my green stock over here is actually an ever-bearing type of strawberry called Ozark Beauty. And these plants will set blooms and fruit all year long, as long as they have the nutrition to do so. So every couple weeks during the season, I'm actually feeding my green stock with this Bloom Plus. And this has quite a lot of phosphorus in the mix. And what that does is it promotes the blooms. And with fruiting plants, blooms equals fruit, and that's what we want. So I'm gonna stick one of these scoops in the top here and then give it a good water. Just sprinkle it in the top pan and then dump in the water. You can tell it mixed everything in pretty well. And what that's gonna do is it's gonna go down this little hole and there's a little tray in each of these tiers that's gonna hold just the amount of water that each tier needs. And once we see water coming out the bottom, we know we've watered the whole thing through and through. I was actually in the greenhouse earlier doing some things and I already have picked this green stock clean. I have found that the fruits on this green stock are much, much tastier than the ones that are in my raised bed garden. And that's because the watering is very controlled in here. And so the flavor doesn't get watered down. And I love that. I'm pretty sure I mentioned that in the last garden tour, but it's definitely worth repeating. <laughs> Why are you so sad, huh? Why are you so sad, boys? So sorry, my boys over here were a little bit loud this week. Hopefully by next week, they will have chilled out a little bit. I just weaned them from their mamas. So they're a little bit sad, but they'll be just fine. 